Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 86, and I'm hanging out after a full day of teaching, and I'm already tired, so we'll see how this goes. Trevor Frost, how are you? Good. How are you? Awesome. Yep. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Joey Hendricks. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys were roommates together. Yes, we sure were. Tell it me was. about that experience. Uh, well, <laughs> well, the first, first thing that I thought of was the, the frogs that you had. I did have frogs. That is correct. Yeah, I yeah. used to have pet frogs. Is that allowed in dorms? No, no, it's absolutely not. not. No, it's not. But I got really good at hiding them. So if whenever there's an RA check, it was like, oh look, nothing's here. Yeah. <laughs> but my first thought is the fact that it was in a nine-person suite, and we were in a triple in the suite. Oh, that's we were, right. We were the only three guys, and the rest was six girls. That's right. That's yeah. what I think that's of a- when <laughs> <laughs> we lived together that year. That's right. Oh, what a what a time to be alive! What a great time to be alive! Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> college is a lot of fun. It, it college, sure yeah. is. Yeah, still in college, quite frankly, but it's not as fun. Technically, well, same. Oh yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Just different fun stuff. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so let's let's start with this. Like, so what what do you notice around that makes good band directors? Uh, do you have a few hours? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, what are some yeah, like some things that list. like yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay, I'll start like obviously relationship to your students, right? Mm -hmm. Like being able to connect with every single kid as much as possible. Yeah, 100%. And I think being able to do that consistently day by day, and then also being able to relate them and their lives to whatever music you're doing, I think is just as important. And good band directors do that consistently, Yeah, I think. Uh, I would also add the, there is a... um, um, an empathetic side mm. that I feel a uh, band director should have, um, like kind of understanding where the students are coming from, because uh, we don't necessarily know what is going on outside of their school life. Um, you know, you know, you have a student that walks in and and it, not necessarily like you know causing any hard times or anything like that, but kind of looking dejected and kind of not yeah. um, engaging and and. Just kind of letting them know, like, hey, like, if you need something, let me know. Um, try to live in the moment, be present here with um, uh, with us. If if you're unable to, just just let me know, you know. Um, so having that having that empathy, I find, is very important, especially when it comes to a band director, because you see so many students. What I struggle with is I understand all that and I want to do that. Right. But I think if we go too far and let the kids take whatever, whenever, then there's the other side of that. Yeah. Like, Yo, when I, to do I that and when to bring them to you and say, mm-hmm. put it aside and move on. Like that's, yeah. that's a hard balance. Yeah. yeah, it's the balance of like meeting them where they are, but also like having them meet you halfway. Like, yes, I can give you some leeway, but at the same time, like, oh, for you're sure. not going to not do anything for a week. Oh, for sure. It's, <laughs> it's not one of those things where it's kind of like, okay, here we go. Time to hold your hand right. kind of thing. Um, but uh, when, I was, when I was teaching, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the kids were, um, didn't have great home lives. Uh, and I could usually tell uh, when they're having like kind of an off day uh, here or there. So uh, before they actually entered the classroom, um, I would take them aside like, hey, I notice that you're having a bit of a sh- uh, struggle today. Just let me know if I can do something to help. But I also need you to or I, I would I would like you to do your best to participate and uh, see what you can do. And we kind of like have that little um, Kind of like agreement uh it was just uh, it was just me and the students so it kind of was uh, special for them at the time uh and most often than not it, it it would um it would turn out to be a good thing yeah. but you also find that a lot of those students that are struggling like that from home life a lot of times it's because of a lack of structure mm-hmm. at home right yeah. like lack lack of dependability so when they come in and they know there's a routine and they know there's a warm-up and they know they have to do this and they're part of something yeah sometimes changing that isn't good for them mm-hmm. right so that's one thing that, that, that why they like band yeah you took the words right out of my mouth because i talked about this well i talked about the, this with crystal pretty recently how like you know a lot of times other classroom teachers will like overly coddle certain kids or like if there's a big life event they'll like like oh hey whatever you need whatever but you know having band be that safe space where there is that structure and it kind of like is the one normal place for them to be because we're not like you know yep. necessarily making like this huge accommodation for them like sometimes yeah they need that to just have something feel normal if something in their life has blown up it's like yeah. oh band room is my safe space and this is what we're doing and i can kind of forget about 
what's going on outside because I'm here doing this. And if you're huge. and if you've done the work to vertically align your like middle school, high school stuff, a lot of times that's when they move to high school. If you run your high school band like they ran the middle school band, like the, you can just start right away on day one. Yeah. Whereas everything else to them is brand new mm -hmm. except for the band room. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of having um, staff meetings within uh, districts. Yeah. Uh, so when I was student teaching at Spalding High School in uh, Rochester, New Hampshire, there would be kind of like uh semester meetings uh they'd have one every semester where it would be the high school directors middle school directors elementary school directors they'd be all sit in a room and uh kind of like go over like okay so what are you planning on doing what are your goals how can we help with that and just having that whole collaboration um across k through 12 grades is super important and i feel like not a lot of districts do that but mm -hmm. I, I could be completely wrong who knows but i mm -hmm. it's i find that very important especially when it comes to the k-12 through public schools and the high school teachers are not necessarily the better teachers in fact sometimes no. it's opposite you know yeah, you my, need the strong my, school my daughter who's 12 so take it for what it's worth <laughs> yeah. always thinks that i'm a better teacher than my wife because my kids sound better i'm like no, no, you, no. that's not how this works honey no. you right. know so I think there's those high school teachers who say, I've told the middle school teachers what they need to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm going to stop you right there. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> it, It's almost that like you ask the middle school teachers what they think you can do to help. Mm -hmm. And then you take that and then use it the best way you can. Yeah. It's like it's, you worship the ground your middle school teachers yeah. walk on. Yeah. <laughs> Especially they, like, if, you're, your if you're a middle school teacher and you're a mom. Holy smokes. Holy. Yeah. Yeah. You're my hero. Oh, man. So what else makes a good teacher? Programming, easy enough. How about that? Yeah. Pushing the kids in the right way, but also programming music that they can really sound good on, not just, what is it, chasing notes until the day of the concert. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's like too many directors, and both veteran and newer, because I did this a lot my first couple of years teaching. It's like, we all did. It's easy to program for the band you want to have rather than like looking at the band you have and actually programming programming for what's going to make them successful um too many teachers fall into that pitfall of like well yeah like like you said earlier like you know we're a high school band so we got to play grades four and five no. if your kids aren't there don't program fours and fives <laughs> and like what what's the name of the kid who's playing the second trombone part and what's the name of the kid who's playing right. the baritone part for mm -hmm. kids and if that's not a good growth spot for them you shouldn't do the piece absolutely yeah no, I've I've uh, just kind of struggled with that myself um so my recent um conducting recital I you know, was uh, programming some stuff, and I knew for a fact that I wanted to do Igor Stravinsky's octet. Like I knew that for a fact. Like okay, that was going to be the piece but that was going to. Let's just around. clarify: you're now a grad student in Nebraska. Yes, yeah, that, that this is, is not a K to eight. These, these are not college kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these, are, these are college students. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, and so that was one piece that I knew for a fact I was going to do. Uh, the problem was I would actually attach things to it that had similar difficulties, and uh, my advisor, Dr. Carolyn Barber. Um, was like, yeah, yeah, you're over programming. Like, take a step back. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Like, when was the last time you played music that when you looked at it, it wasn't overwhelming? It mm -hmm. was like just a good sweet spot and you got to really make good music. Like, mm -hmm. how great is that? You sit in, a, sit in a community band or something and you can play it and you sound great. Yeah. How do you feel when you're playing something with nine million notes? Like, you don't feel great about it right. unless you have time. To prepare it mm -hmm. you know and of course we're you're professional so mm -hmm. right um so all of us come from the andy boys and tree yep that is I, correct <laughs> I'm, I'm part of the younger andy boys and tree you guys are part of the older andy boys and tree i think he's always going to be 31 in my book but um <laughs> i thought he was 25 that's yeah, wild yeah uh, so <laughs> i met him when he was 27 three kids married and had like 30 or 40 pieces for band and yep. i'm like wow okay um so what is it that makes Andy a great teacher? We're talking about great teachers. So like, I didn't prep you guys for that, but what is it when you think of him, like what does he model as good teaching? Uh, I think one thing that I always admired about him is like, obviously the man's brilliant, but he never like approached it as a way of being like, well, I'm smart and you're dumb, so let me help you. It's like, he like knows what he's talking about, but he leads it like in such a humble way that you're just like, you're kind of in awe as he's teaching. Cause you're just like, wow. Like mm -hmm. he knows what he's doing. He's so good at it, but like ask him how he thinks he does. And he'll be like, oh, that's just, I'm just not doing Greg. I gotta get better and get, get oh, he, he's oh, humble yeah. to a fault, honestly. Oh yeah. Um, so it's like being in a rehearsal space, an educational space to see that, um, that humility, I think just makes it that much more relatable to all the kids that he teaches. Cause if he, it's not scary to work under him. It's like, 
oh, that's, you know, Andy Boyd. He's great. Yeah. That's, that's probably one of the top reasons why he's such a great band director. Mm -hmm. uh, just his, uh, his humbleness and his humility uh, and his willingness to say, that was my fault. My bad. I, I, I did that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it was just a complete pleasure to work with him. And he did that. Bad. He did that once when we were doing something Hindemith. I forget it was. It might have been the symphony. And we were in a movement and we stopped and he's like, you know what? I need to do more homework. I don't know where I don't, I'm not where I need to be. So we put it away yeah. early because he, he, he had said that. Um, he is also good. Like he's not a, somebody dis to discipline very much. Right. He like, he's, that he kind of is nice and things kind of just run smoothly. Yeah. yeah. There was a time and I was there for it. it. He had gotten a bunch of grad students who were there and there was the kids who were in the wind symphony were playing undergrad students and they wanted to be playing under him more right so there was like this coup that was forming the kids were kind of like yeah all upset like i'm paying the money and i'm have grad students i don't have any boys in for more than two pieces or whatever and they were all upset he started this rehearsal at 11 10. and he said just so you know i've heard about this and i just want you to know that at any point i'm happy to sign your ad drop slip i i don't want to stand in the way of that no problem but if there's no more questions let's tune perfect amazing and just it was like okay <laughs> it was him kind of saying you know this is what we're going to do and you can get out if you need to right yeah Fantastic. I loved <laughs> I loved working under grad students because like it was also cool to see him in like the other educational role to like help them as they're conducting mm -hmm. the group. Because it's all a learning experience. You yeah. know, oh, whether sure. it's whether it's a hundred percent him or like eighty percent him, twenty percent grad students, whatever, like it's everyone can still get a lot from that. Yeah. I mean, we're all on the same team here. Like yeah. Um also like I, I just love working with different conductors. Uh, yeah. you uh you experience different things with different conductors. They mm -hmm. they all have their uh, little um, niches and um, little um, uniqueness about them. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm always a fan of like the more conductors you see, the more conductors you work with, uh, the better overall performer musician you are because yeah. you have all these different types of experiences that you can take with you. It's like oh I like that mm -hmm. from this person, or you like that from this person, and then if you decide to become a conductor, you can build your own conductor um using those bits and pieces that you've gotten from different conductors yeah i was going to say something similar because you know working with so many conductors you can see the good and the bad and like i have many examples that i'm not going to call out obviously but it's like i'd see someone do something and go oh i don't want to ever do yeah, something yeah. like that but then see something else and go oh i oh, should try okay. that like yeah like you said yeah. like take bits and pieces to work best for you mm -hmm. yeah that's right like kids learn so much from that like we have music ed classes right but, yeah but i felt like as a band director I learned more sitting in wind symphony class than I did in any ed class. And that's not to put them down, but like yeah. you just watch the methodical way that he does stuff. And you're yeah. like, okay, I'm just going to do that. Yeah. 100%. Like, that's how I'm going to do it. And then you realize not everybody does that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, well, I want to get into Trevor's grad school stuff and you're composing in the wilderness project and what's happening at university of Nebraska. That's so cool. And, yeah. and all that, but really first let's just do a, a quick, um, background in, teaching so you've been teaching how many years uh so uh oh my goodness eight, uh eight, nine, eight, eight, seven, 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 eight, seven. Yeah, seven. and seven. you were at a k to eight school yep i was a k through eight school um what was cool about that program uh the cool thing about that was i built the program from scratch and yeah. i can do really whatever i wanted with it um so i entered and they they had like seven instruments and like five of them were broken mm. and i was like cool exciting so uh i went in there and you know built a band program from the ground up and built a chorus program you know got grants for um notation uh and we did a lot of performances from that uh from then on um cool. so i think the coolest thing about that was just having the opportunity to actually build something you know uh get instruments get music yeah. um and a lot of the kids were um very interested in performing um and you know i i took the chorus to i actually did this a couple times uh took them to sing the national anthem at a unh men's hockey game and they they just got a kick out of that and yeah. all the parents were like this is so cool this is amazing uh so kind of getting on the map kind of uh, and then my final year i actually <clears throat> i actually auditioned well I selected two students in the uh, in the middle school choir to perform at the new 
uh, it was like, what's it called? It was like the middle school honors choir that uh, NHMEA puts on. Mm. And they were just so excited beyond belief. And they were performing at such a high level. And their parents went to the concert and the performance. And they came up to me after. was like, this was amazing. Like, thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> um, so, so probably that. Having these opportunities to build this program from, from scratch and seeing these students who didn't really have a music program before yeah. I started uh, and seeing them and hearing them perform at such a high level. Well, what I love about that is like the way you took it, like, cause you could easily say, oh, I have to build this program. Yeah. Yeah. But it was like, I get to build this program. Oh yeah. Which is so cool. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to mention just as a side note, you talked about broken horns. Mm -hmm. we, we all have those, right? Oh, yeah. So I will say if anybody wants to reach out and connect with me, I know of a business that will come to your school anywhere in the US. But you make an appointment, they come to you and you set aside all the stuff you basically want to get rid of yeah and you take they they'll take it and you'll work out a trade they'll give you money mm -hmm. or trade more importantly trade for other instruments and this company has like everything you could ever imagine times 10. wow and you can basically say yeah i want to get rid of these 25 snare drums that was us mm -hmm. and three broken tenors and an old valve trombone that doesn't work and i'm going to get a new berry in return that's cool you know it's super cool so yeah. if anybody wants to do anything like that let me know i'm happy to put you in touch with them all right, Joey, you're at Westbrook now, and you're, I'm at, you're at Yarmouth now, before yep. that. Yep, I was at Yarmouth for six years. Um, what was well, cool about that program? What was cool about that is that, so before I was hired there, um, there was only one person at the high school doing both the choir and the band program, Rick Dustin, who's a great educator, still there. Um, Those people who do both are just amazing. It's Yeah, it's two full-time jobs at once, like yeah. insane. Um, but then um, after some time, superintendent was like, why isn't this two positions? So they created what became my position at the time was a halftime position. Um, so like the band program actually had like one dedicated person to work with them. Cause before it was one concert band and like they had to alternate with the choir. So they'd only get banned like one to two times a week or it'd be like band or study hall. So like it was never consistent. Um, so then they hired me, they split it up into concert band, went ensemble and like, you know, when it was band period, it was band period. So like the first year or two, first year, there was a lot of pushback of like, well, why don't we get a study hall like this day? And I was like, because you're in band and like it's yeah there's no alternating teachers anymore. changing the culture right? yeah absolutely but you understand where they're coming from because oh, they course. were used to it yeah they were used to the schedule of like you know it's the combined band and choir day and you know someday you do one someday you do the other fine um but it was really cool to you know before the pandemic hit like see how much growth was able to happen in a little over three years to you know almost double the band program and like get kids more invested and like be able to you know once I got better at programming, to, like have them achieve a lot of stuff that like I never would have imagined during that first year, um, was just really cool. And now we got you. And now, yeah, now you got me. We're stuck with you at least. <laughs> okay. Um, one, well, one thing that's cool too is that if, because a lot of people who ask about like, should I split my band or should I have one big band? Yeah. Right. And I mean, you could, there's good and bad about both, right? Mm -hmm. So say you have a hundred kids. Do you want a hundred person band where the seniors are now leading the freshmen and they like your band always sounds better because you have older kids and all this mm -hmm. or do you split them so you can give curriculum that's appropriate for the lower 50 versus the upper 50 yeah right? that was um, a balance i tried to find early on too because what i was told going into it was like you know a lot of older kids would end up quitting because the music wasn't challenging them because it was you know being programmed for those freshman age kids um so like that was one thing keeping the program from growing yep. um so it's like yeah i would try to get a program accordingly but also a lot of times would like do more combined pieces with everyone um so yes one ensemble had their own thing but a lot of times concert band was both together um which did that for a couple of years to grow it and then they be kind of became their own ent entities I, I, I mean, I'll put, I have a friend, a couple of friends who keep their band big and it's because it's like the safety thing, you know, mm, we have yeah. more people there. We know we can do this, this, and this. I always go the other way. I'm like, I'd rather pull out all my younger kids and have them. It's coming in high school is a step up anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and then absolutely. after their freshman year, then they're available either for the next band or the top band or whatever it is. But I mean, think about it from a curriculum standpoint, they've jumped from grade one and a half, maybe two. And now you have seniors who are going to be ready for four or five, whatever. Yeah. You have to meet in the middle and nobody yeah. like, you know, kids come home and they're like, I can't, I don't even know where I am in my band music because mm -hmm. it's too hard. So how does that feel for them? Right. So to me, the secret is getting, getting split bands if you have the numbers and then making them both sound good. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, yeah. We all agree. That's Look at that. Check. <laughs> all right. So we are still paid for what we're doing. You're a grad student. I'm a grad You're student. You're getting paid for, to be a grad student. Yes. Yes. 
Great. But like for like grad student so salary. <laughs> right. You're, salary. you're with Carolyn Barber at um, University of Nebraska Lincoln. Yes. Okay. Why did you choose to go there? Uh, so, uh, story time. Uh, so it was during my master's at UNH working with Andy. Um, uh, and it was after the, our first concert of the fall semester of 2020. And it was just in kind of like a conducting lesson. And I just kind of mentioned it as like, Hey, I, I think I'm, I think I want to audition for, um, for my doctorate. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. He, he start. Uh, I, I wouldn't say panicking, but kind of like, Oh my God, I, we should have been like doing work like months ago on this and blah, blah, blah. And like, Oh, I didn't. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so he gave me some, uh, um, some recommendations of schools. Uh, so he recommended West Virginia, Maryland, um, uh, Oh, uh, George Mason, I think. Mm. Uh, but he also mentioned like, Oh, the university of Nebraska Lincoln, uh, they're doing some, weird wacky stuff and i feel like you'd be into that it's like okay cool so i did some research uh looking into the wind ensemble uh at uh unl and he was right they were doing some weird things uh dr carolyn barber the director of bands there uh doesn't call herself a conductor uh, she calls herself more of a facilitator uh so she would do these uh programs and she would involve the audience in very different ways from what the traditional system uh would would see usually in the traditional system you you go in you sit down you listen and yay, yay everyone claps and all that stuff um where whereas the ensemble performance lab the wind ensemble at unl uh we want the audience to get involved uh so there were a couple programs um uh this past this past year where we invited some audience members on the stage to dance with us uh so that was fun and she developed this kind of like kahoot thing to play while the concert was happening uh so um hmm. we did uh lewis buckley's uh bright brightly colored dances and uh had three movements in it uh for three or four uh and each movement was named after a color so after we performed a movement and like, you know, there was a hat and she would, you know, pick out a movement from the hat and the audience would try to have to guess what color mm -hmm. we just performed. And a lot of it is based off of in, um, intention projection, um, having the performers project their intention like, okay, I'm playing red to you now, you know? Uh, so that was really the, that was really the thing that that um, drew me to mm -hmm. that program, uh, just different ways of thinking. How does that, how do rehearsals look in that system? Uh, Is this like conductorless rehearsals? Uh, so she'll, uh, she'll conduct when necessary. Uh, if there's, uh, she usually conducts during um, a lot of time changes and a lot of transition material. Um, but for the most part, we kind of start on our own and you know, yeah, we just kind of go, go, go on. Um, there, there are actually some rehearsals where she actually told us that she's getting jealous because if she uh, starts conducting, then we actually perform at a lower level, mm -hmm. which is just, I think it's really funny. So the thought <laughs> right. is that the thought is that there's, you guys can fix more. Do you fix problems and stuff on your own too? When you yep. stop, like, what do you want to work on? And it's more ensemble based rather than the teacher telling you. Yeah, it's more ensemble based. So we'll, we'll play a section and then it'll fall apart. That's fine. Uh, then we kind of reflect on it's like, okay, so what happened? What do you, what do you need from there? And a lot of the performers, and we actually encourage this, um, the ensemble performers will actually talk to each other. Like, Hey, I need, I need you to play louder here so I can enter uh, at this bar here, mm -hmm. or, uh, it, it's, it's a really big collaboration project. And Dr. Yeah. Barber is just facilitating that. I'm curious because I'm, you know, I know there's a lot of people, the younger you get, obviously the harder this is, mm -hmm. but I'm curious what ways you can do that as kids get younger and younger and younger. I'm yeah. sure there's ways. I'm sure for sure. So there's actually, uh, we, we, we call them, uh, lab partners. Uh, so there's lab partners in the middle school levels, uh, that kind of, that are acro across the country. Uh, and they're, they're very successful with it too. Uh, there are, and I can't, I can't name them off the top of my head right now, but a lot of middle school programs are 
getting learn like they're learning more about this hmm. and they are reaching out to Dr. Barber and saying, Hey, I'd love to sit in with a rehearsal, uh, either, uh, in person or zoom, um, just kind of observing hmm. and seeing what kind of ideas come up and all that stuff. And so it's, it's, it's very much doable. Um, I did a little bit of the, what we call lab work, like ensemble games, uh, that we do, uh, at UNL, uh, at the, um, during my recent residency in Lebanon, um, uh, Lebanon High School here in New Hampshire, um, and they 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 got a kick out of it. They they really did, and uh, it's it's all about experimentation too. We don't know if it's going to work or not, mm -hmm. right? But if it doesn't work, then let's try to make it work. So do you set up in a normal setup or in a different setup? Or uh, it, it's it's different every day. It, it really I, is because I've seen wind ensembles that like they set up in a circle or a box, just like a jazz band, yeah. would, just a big. Mm -hmm group and yeah the i i don't want to say standard but the the go-to is uh like a typical box yeah you know but uh most of the time we actually we actually prefer to be scrambled mm. and you know so every, like mixed, mixed parts. sections too. yep yeah. yep and okay. every every rehearsal we pick a pick a different spot you know and yeah. it's it's all about triangulation like seeing different performers and communicating that way visually um as well uh do you perform in a different function like like do you perform in different ways or do you perform standard setup uh different ways as well yeah. uh we performed at the um cbdna north north division in madison wisconsin uh, and we did a performance where we started in a box and then we got up and then we ch changed seats in the box and then the final piece we actually just took everything and just scrambled hmm. It was a lot of fun uh, and the audience was just getting a kick out of it too because here's a bunch of college band directors who are used to the traditional format and here we are just you know yeah. who knows where we're gonna stand <laughs> right yeah 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 so it i'm you know and you said you get a you get really good results out of that and you know um i think that's great that she is willing to like think outside the box and it's really seems more like it's about the process than always making things yeah fine in the and, end. yeah yeah in that's that that's one of her things like it's more about the process and the experimentation rather than the results we all know that the results going to be the result but it's the the process of it and the experimentation is more important and we value that more. you know i talked with a teacher once who was just amazing because in the end i she always got me to have my own ideas but they were her ideas but i thought they were my ideas yeah right <laughs> so it seems like like if with younger kids if you can get it so like they are producing the work to why it can be better and how to make the group better mm. but it's coming from them not you that's a pretty awesome thing yeah i'm absolutely. just thinking about a bunch of 13 year olds and having never done that before how i would do with that how do you approach it yeah. yeah so does she have any resources out there a website or anything we can yeah so uh uh, uh her website is uh carolyn barbercom um there is there's a lot of uh, resources that she puts on there. Uh, she talks a lot about ensemble ship, which is a term that she coined. So rather than musicianship for one musician, it's ensemble ship. You're showing um, the entire ensemble that idea. Uh, and this is this is her research. She's been working on on this for like 20, 15 plus years or so. Mm. The ensemble performance lab didn't really start until 2019 and she's she's been researching this for 15 plus years mm. um so definitely check out our website uh definitely check out some of the youtube videos of the ensemble performance lab at uh the university of nebraska lincoln uh there is a ton of stuff and i i just also just shoot her an email yeah like she's very accessible and mm -hmm. she loves to talk to people sweet That's awesome yeah um, real quick, uh, because you mentioned it briefly, can you, for people who don't know, discuss what triangulation means? I only know because you taught me this morning. All right. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. So uh, triangulation is one of the um, one of the teaching tools that we use uh, in the ensemble performance lab. 
it's essentially where, so I'm playing saxophone and I need resources and I need some kind of like signposts uh, as we are navigating a particular um, piece of music. So if I know that a clarinet player has a solo, I'm going to look to that clarinet player and say, oh, okay, you start here, I start two beats after that, perfect. Uh, and then a French horn player might need that same clarinet player, but they can't necessarily see them. So in a lot of this actually come, uh, it uh, stems from the concert arcs that we have. So you can't necessarily see the players that you need the information from. So with this triangulation, uh, I can help that French horn player saying, okay, we play together. You can't see the clarinet solo, but I can. So I'm going to cue you to help you come in at the same time as me. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the premise of triangulation and mm -hmm. there's like if so if you take that concept and divide uh in times it by like like 50 or a so yeah. you have so much communication and so many uh uh, uh eyesights and, yeah uh this yeah it's just a network of in the web it's cool another reason i wish we had a flat band room yeah those tiered tiered <laughs> that'd band be really rooms. nice i agree yeah, they're all the rage. Now, some, maybe some people like them. I found my conducting gets higher and higher and higher. Yeah. So I'm like conducting up to the back and I have to purposely come down. Oh, yeah. My my uh, high school had tiered levels. Mm -hmm. and Mine too. Where'd yeah. you go to school? Milford High School. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at the time, I didn't know any better. But right. at the time, I was like, yeah. oh, this is great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but now I just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. can't deal with that. Yeah, I remember thinking that was the gold standard. <clears throat> and then when I got my first job at Yarmouth, I was like, Oh, because it's just like flat surface. Yeah. Like, it's like, Wait, oh, this is great. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, to get rid of it is. Oh, it's a hassle. A hassle for $100, sure. $100,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not going to happen. No. <laughs> you know, in most places. Not until we get a new school, but that's yeah. <laughs> never going to happen. <laughs> I also found out, I brought this audio person in. And he did like readings in our room. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I've been doing this 20 years. I've never seen a room this bad. <laughs> He's like, every 18 inches when I move, the sound changes. Oh, God. He's like, so what you're hearing here and what they're hearing here is like, there's no chance. Incredible. I said, yeah, we, we go to the performance space and like, it's, it's like heaven. Like, yeah. You can hear things. And he's like, yeah, you can probably balance chords and hear. And it's like, so I said, well, it's probably good. It's like, it's like teaching with all your limbs tied behind your back, right? Mm. If you can have to sound good in that band room, then they can go anywhere and sound good. Right. Oh, but, for sure. But yikes. Anyways. <laughs> um, so now you're doing this thing called composing in the wilderness. Yes, I'm very interested. Yes. Um, where do I where do I start with this? Uh, so like actual wilderness, like yeah, yeah, tents yeah. and. Yep. Yep. For so how long? Uh, let's see. We'll be in the backcountry of Alaska for four days, five days, four days. Okay. Yep. Um, tenting, no electricity, no nothing, nothing like that. No Sibelius. No Sibelius. No. <laughs> no. No finale. Uh, no Wi-Fi? No, I know, right? The, How can you live? A concept. Yeah. When is this happening? Uh, so I actually fly to Anchorage uh, on uh, this Saturday, actually. Wow. So it's coming up. So, so you chose summer, not winter. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> the, the program uh, is uh, run by Stephen Lias. He is, the, uh, he is a composition professor at the University of Stephen F. Austin down in Texas. Yep. Um, so, in, and he's actually been doing these uh, composing in the wilderness trips for about 10 years or so. Uh, all, all the trips before this year's has been chamber works. Uh, so, it's a very similar idea. They'll uh, take six composers out, um, live in the backcountry of Alaska, and uh, they'll write a piece for like violin quartet. Like or one piece and you all write on it? No, uh, so each composer writes their own piece, and then they create a program. And you you start when you get there, and it has to be done in those four days, kind of thing. Uh, yeah, kind of. You so, can't take something you're already working on and like. No, no. Uh, so the so with the chamber with the chamber uh, works, they they'll live in the backcountry for like four days or so, and then they'll go back to Anchorage and they'll reserve a house for like three days or so, uh, and you'll use that time to write your string quartet. Uh, and then they get uh, then they get performed and they make a whole. So you write it, it. But what were you doing? In the, you're you're not writing in the wilderness. No, uh, we're we're just uh, we're just living in the uh, wilderness and we're getting experiences and 
uh, using that experience to write uh, Got those it. works. Yeah. Got it. So with this trip that I'm going on, this is the first year that they're doing it. Uh, they are inviting it to wind band uh, composers. Cool. So this is the very first time that they're doing a wind band one. Uh, which is super exciting. Uh, wind band, love wind band. Uh, so I'll be, uh, so we'll be uh, living in the wilderness of Alaska, and then we'll have three days um, back in Anchorage of this uh, rental house that they have, and uh, three days in like seclusion, drafting sketches and getting getting a um, using uh, kind of like reflecting on our experiences uh, mm -hmm. living out there. And then after those three days, uh, we'll fly back to our designated homes and whatnot. And we'll have the rest of the year to finish those wind band pieces, at which point we'll return them to Stephen. Uh, he'll distribute them to the pre uh, premiering ensembles, uh, which is uh, um, uh, Stephen F. Austin University Wind Ensemble. Uh, there, uh, I want to say Grand Valley University in Michigan and the, uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln wind ensemble. So I thought that was fun. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, so yeah, when you're out there and you're writing sketches, is there anything to write on regarding like, is there a piano sitting around or instruments or like, is it literally, literally like just out of your head, you're just writing? Uh, just kind of, uh, out of, out of my head, uh, especially in the back country. Um, but in the rental houses that right. we'll have, uh, they'll actually, and I plan on bringing my own, um, uh, we'll have like a little MIDI key okay. keyboards and we'll have like technology, just, we won't have it while you're in the, while wilderness. You're in the wilderness. Well, yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah. I, I was under the impression that you were like, now we're back in the house for four, uh, four days and you have to produce a piece before you leave. Like that to me seemed like very stressful. Oh, no. What if you have writer's Impossible. block? What if yeah. you <laughs> well, no. So, so that was the, that was for the chamber groups though. Wow. Uh, so they okay. do the backcountry thing for four days. They go back and that, then they'd write a string quartet for those th in those three days. Mm. Uh, with a wind band, there's more parts and stuff like that. that so makes sense. you need a little more time. Um, to do that but the cool thing is is that once we get there like uh so we take like a couple bush planes um and apparently this is like the most remote location in the world oh, so cool this is like oh my my mother's freaking you're out you're taking this. a of bush course. plane yeah you couldn't pay me enough to get on a bush <laughs> plane like that so one to, of those like tiny yeah. propeller oh yeah so i'm down <laughs> No, Can, do you have a I'd plus walk one? there. <laughs> I don't know if I have a plus one. Um, so to actually get to our base camp, we actually have to take two bush planes, two separate ones, to get to the location where we're going to be exploring. Um, <laughs> I'm stressed just thinking about it. Um, but oh the, the cool thing is, is that once we get to base camp, um, we're actually going to be receiving like kind of like assignments. So mm. each each one of us is going to be writing a particular style or mood uh, oh, of cool. music uh so that way it's not every single composer writes this you know slow lyrical thing uh we're, we're about the wind and about the wind right, the water yeah. and all that stuff it's mm -hmm. it uh we're creating a diverse program here so when you go into the wilderness you know okay in the end i need to produce a piece like this yes so when you're there you're kind of thinking about yeah what inspires you and yeah so, so there's sort of guidelines in a yeah sense. so the, there's guidelines uh regarding like uh length grade level um instrumentation is kind of like standard wind ensemble there is some right way i'm sure um but we we get uh we do get kind of guidelines like this is the kind of piece we're looking for you from you so cool super exciting i'm super i'm super stoked for it um and i love camping i've always loved camping um but this is like intense camping. yeah camping uh, times camping. 50 <laughs> yeah yeah so i'm i'm super excited you literally just added a joke in there that you didn't know about i probably because we talk yeah. about that being intense like camping like intense intense oh. <laughs> <laughs> literally intense yeah. next time you want to say a joke to one of your students and have them not get it they say something and you say that's intense like camping and they go huh? what <laughs> they just mean? move on it's like, it's oh, funny. okay cool yeah super cool that's yeah. great yeah so looking forward to it um also just like the networking and getting to like going on this experience with these other composers yeah. like yeah because as a as as a conductor too i can look back and say like you know i really like that piece mm -hmm. like i i know what you did what else can you do so i can commission as well uh that's and vice versa yeah exactly mm -hmm. so that's kind of the uh, the beauty of being a 
uh, composer conductor too. Uh, yeah, I can write my own stuff and I can conduct my own stuff, which is, you know, great and all that stuff, but I'm more interested in what other people can do. Uh, and I'd rather commission other folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I view this as a very big stepping stone into that world and, uh, getting, getting more works from, from these folks. Yeah. And I'll, I'll recommend that people, I mean, if you're a band director, you have a band at your disposal, mm -hmm. right? So like if you have any sort of itch to arrange anything or to write anything, do it while oh, yeah. you have a band, you know, you have to write it to their level. Oh yeah. So, but I think too many people think they can't be composers or they can't be arrangers. Right. Um, I should say, if you want, if you don't want to do it, like I know some teachers who have no interest, mm -hmm. like don't do it. It's yeah. fine. But if you have any interest, you should do it. And Sibelius is far better than Finale. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, I know. I remember we thought about this a lot we in college. Have. Sibelius is much better, but uh, it's well, fine. <laughs> well, I've been, I've been using Finale for like over yeah. 10 years It's now. maniacal. It's just... <laughs> you just have to know how to use it. It's never too late to change. <laughs> yeah, but I know a lot of people who are world-class and they use Finale. And you're right. It's like once right. you know it, you know it. Yeah, it's... it's, it's yeah. You can get a whole discussion about that. <laughs> I'm sure that's what they want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What does Control F do in Finale versus? Anyways, oh <laughs> I haven't used either in a while, so uh, I just from my memory, I liked Sibelius. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a great conversation. Anything else we want to add that we haven't we haven't uh, talked about? I can't think well, of anything off the top of my head. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll let, let the people be. Cool. Yeah. We'll let the people be. Check out my website if you want. Oh yeah, tell oh, us yeah. about it. Yeah, it's uh, TrevorFrostMusic.com. Um, uh, I put put up uh, highlights of the Lebanon High School uh, yep. residency, um, so that's premiered. Uh, the but the bridge it's unforgiving for wind band and SATB choir, so that's up. Um, but yeah, and if people are looking for somebody to commission, I'm sure you'd love to write. Oh man, please, yeah. That's I, I just I just love writing for groups and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So I mean, as someone who's personally played a couple of your pieces, like they're great. So. Thank you. Highly recommend. Yeah, you're biased. <laughs> Just because you wrote a saxophone solo piece for me, like that's fair. <laughs> Who would write a saxophone solo? Like, Actually, so ever. I, I've gotten two composers to write me pieces when I was in college. So yeah. it's over here. Yeah. So uh, definitely check out my website if you want. I'm also on Instagram, uh, Trevor Frost Music. Uh, so give me a follow. Also on YouTube, but yeah. Keep and on I'm, keeping. And on. I'm just here. <laughs> and I'm just here. All right. <laughs> See you later, everybody. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director. See you next week.